Hello Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. I want to talk about something in kind of a weird backwards way. I've told people for a long time, when you're a newcomer to ham radio, if you can avoid it, avoid buying used equipment. Get new equipment if you can. Now, I'm going to illustrate that with an airplane story. In fact, my own airplane story. Um, I've been unable to fly um, in uh, November and December and into January because of this problem that I had uh, with a GI bleed. And then I promptly broke my ankle in the early January and I'm still sitting here in a wheelchair waiting for that to heal. So I've only flown once this year. There was like a one day window between um, when, when I could fly before I broke my ankle. Now we had to abort that flight because as it turned out, the pitot hose that comes from the pitot tube, the pitot tube is a tube pointed forward and air comes in that and the air pressure is directly proportional to the speed at which you're traveling and that is what runs the uh, speedometer in the uh, airplane and it stopped working just as we took off and uh, come to find out it was uh, because of the hose had uh, cracked uh, where I had put it on the new Garmin G5 uh, so they fixed that at the uh, local FBO and uh, then I went down to the hangar and my flight instructor and I, even though I can't fly, we were going to spin the compass, which means calibrate the compass on the thing. There's a compass rose on, painted on the uh, airport uh, taxiway and you can position your aircraft over it and you know just exactly which direction it's putting and then you can calibrate your compass. Well, I walked into the hangar and the first thing I smelled was fuel. And as it turned out, that green hose that cracked before it was also used as fuel line. It had cracked and it was basically emptying the nearly full fuel tanks all over the floor. So uh, did, did, did a little bit of investigation on that and uh, finally came up with this as the leading theory. The aircraft has lived its life in Phoenix. Um, for about the last 10 years, it has been hangered and left alone. Um, and the hose in there has gone through those heating and cooling cycles for 10 years. And the hose is just too old and too brittle to use. So I told the uh, mechanic, I says, look, as long as there's a piece of green hose in this airplane, I don't consider it airworthy. I want all the fuel hose replaced, all the pedo and all the static tubing replaced. And that's what they're doing. And, uh, you know, it's not cheap, but I don't trust it. I mean, what if I had a fuel leak in flight? What would that be? Well, they came across something else, too, that I'll show you at the very end. But this is a used aircraft, okay, that was reputed to be by a certified uh, a and mechanic, that's aircraft and power plant uh, mechanic, to be in great shape. And uh, I've flown it, I flew it a lot in uh, August, and then flew it when we got back up here before I had the GI bleed. And um, I was flying a time bomb. So this, this is good. This is goodness. And I thank the good Lord for uh, allowing me to break my ankle and thus be unable to fly and thus be able to have this problem happen and we can get it fixed before I go flying the thing around and find myself either out of fuel or with a fire uh, or with another problem that I'll show you uh, happened later on. The bottom line here is that I bought someone else's problem. I bought an aircraft that was a problem for somebody else. They hid it when it was sold. It was kind of a confusing way that the ownership transitioned in order to get to me. 
So I'm going to go through some things here and show you first of all the beautiful airplane and then show you what's inside and what happened to it. Uh, with a lesson in mind, of course, I think a lot of the people who follow my channel are pilots and so there's interest in just the aircraft side of the story. But if you're just a ham, I want you to go through and say, if I were new to this, would I have known to look for that? And it's the same thing with radios. You get a radio and there's a problem and there wasn't a problem when you looked at it before. What do you do? So let's look at these charts and um, <clears throat> prepare at the very end for uh, the kind of issue that sends chills up and down your spine. Okay? This is the uh, tale of the uh, RANS. It's a kit that was made by a company called RANS. They're in uh, Kansas, in Hayes, Kansas. And this model is the Coyote 2, and that's the N number uh, for the aircraft. You can look that up and find my name. Uh, this right here happens to be a cable that just holds this in place. You can see by the slight wrinkles down here, this is cloth covered. It's not covered in, in tin or anything. It's covered in cloth. Um, aircraft cloth. It's, it's actually sail cloth that's been treated. This right here is a little uh, thing you can bend back and forth to give the rudder uh, just a, a little bit of a hint one way or another. This is me on uh, the two, one of the two happiest days um, an aircraft owner has. The uh, first one is when you purchase it and the second is when you sell it. But anyway, uh, this is just prior, uh, before purchasing the aircraft in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, this is before I went up in the test ride and um, a, a guy, there's a long story about uh, why Kevin was the guy who took me up for the test ride. Um, but everything worked perfectly. Everything worked perfectly. I loved it. So um, this is what the avionics panel looked like uh, before uh, I bought the aircraft. This right here is an artificial horizon. It's kind of a weird one. Um, this is a very old uh, GPS, but it still has maps and stuff that you can use. Um, and here we are. Oh, I wanted to point out that the artificial horizon was bad by the time I came back in, in August of uh, 2020 to pick it up. It had stopped working. And I've since taken it apart and have no idea why it stopped working. Couldn't find anything wrong with it. So um, I went down for two weeks of instruction in Arizona in August. Uh, which shows you my state of mind. I was eager enough to do it that I was willing to put up with uh, 110 degree heat uh, to do it, but the airplane flies fine with that. This is in Cortez, Colorado. My flight instructor, Kevin, was uh, flying with me to take this home, and we stopped for the night in Cortez, fueled up there, and uh, took it on over the hill into Delta. It really helps that I know the g general geography around here because you can't get from Cortez to Delta. You've got to go up a ways to the west and then fly east and then you can fly north to Delta uh, to avoid the mountains. Now here's problem number one. Um, the front wheel tends to caster when I push the aircraft backwards into the hangar, which means it's very difficult to steer into the hangar. The wheel wants to go to one side or the other. I need a tow bar to both steer and push backwards. That means it should connect here and on the other side, and then I can push it backwards. Uh, one was delivered with the aircraft long lost. Uh, this is about a 2007 vintage aircraft. I've talked to the company that made the kit and uh, did not get a very enthusiastic response uh, from RANS. And uh, I've gotten a quote from someone for $2,500 for a little battery powered one. And I'm going, youch. So I need something. It's just, I mean, the aircraft is very light and it can be pushed, but it has to be pushed up a slight incline into the hangar. 
and with that wheel castering like crazy, I have to be in the back holding down the back of the aircraft so this wheel goes up in the air and then someone else pushes the plane in and when I start soloing I'm going to need to be able to do that by myself so I'm looking for a tow bar. Okay that's a problem but it is not an airworthiness problem. What happened uh, next uh, is, let me just show you a picture here of the Garmin G5 replaces the malfunctioning artificial horizon and does many other things too. It's very nice, it's the experimental version uh, the experimental version of their stuff, since it's an experimental uh, amateur-built aircraft, does not have to be certified and literally costs half of what the certified uh, one does. But I put this in here and I had to hook up the pedo and static tube to it. So I unhooked it from the old instrument and hooked it up to the new instrument and that's where we got the first cracks. Because we went to use this to fly it and the airspeed indicator came alive as we were going down the runway and then it zeroed just about the time we took off. So we took one loop around and uh, parked it. This is just showing the inside. This, by the way, is the flap handle, not the parking brake. Okay, so uh, this is a picture I took yesterday. The aircraft is in the hangar at the fixed base operator, or FBO, in uh, Delta. And here is on the floor some of that nasty green hose and you can see a piece of it coming out here and so on. This is the end of the wing, uh, the wing tip taken off and uh, it's very interesting. Now he's cut off all the ends so he can save the little pieces of hardware and this is just a sample of what he cut off and I want to look at this one. It's going to be a little fuzzy, but uh, I want to look at that one in detail. Do you see the split? What happened was um, the cold, the cold weather causes that stuff to split. We've had some days where it's been 20 degrees Fahrenheit or in the teens Fahrenheit, uh, well below zero Celsius and uh, that is what has caused the problem with that ancient Greek tube, green tubing which um, was put in in the 2007 era and probably would have been fine then but it spent so much time in very hot unventilated hangars for about 10 years. The aircraft was sat idle for about 10 years. Um, this is looking inside the wing from the left end. You can see the wing spars here, okay, and then the various pipes that everything is welded to and hooked to and riveted to and all that sort of thing. And this is the pedo tube right here with that green tubing. It's cut off because they're going to put clear plastic tubing there. Um, what they did for the hose was some black tubing and the pedo and static is all going to be uh, white plastic tubing. Okay, so um, this just gives you the look at the rest of the wing. It's flat on the bottom and it's got the usual curve on the top and you can see it's made of fabric which is sewn together uh, right there. Um, this now is, oh I guess you could call it the back of the fuselage or the front of the empennage because uh, this is a little baggage compartment right here where you can put something up to 30 pounds. And here are, is all the tubing and wiring coming from the left wing. And the black tubing is for the um, tank. There are two drains on the tank, one at the front, one at the back, so that uh, you won't have the problem of in an unusual attitude in the aircraft losing uh, fuel because uh, the uh, fuel drain is exposed to air. So there's two of them coming here. The white one is the, or white or clear is the pedo. And then this is electronic wiring that goes out to the nav lights and to the ADSB. Uh, and you can see how all the uh, fabric has been tied and, and so on and so forth. Okay, 
Uh, this is a real problem for them. That's a really small hole to put all that stuff through, but they're good and they did it. This is uh, looking underneath. This is Ron, the mechanic at Smiling Aviation. Uh, he's holding on to the, the flap there, um, and he's pushing tubing through a tube that runs the length of the wing uh, to get it out where it needs to be. Okay, and here is, whoops, 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 I'm pushing the wrong thing. Let me push this over here. Okay, this is looking in here. This is the very end of the wing. It's a cap on the side of the wing. It was riveted. They had to drill out all the rivets to get to it so they could get inside the wing. The tanks are just inboard uh, right here at the very inboard point of the wing on both sides and then the uh, fuel comes down here and there's a the two tubes come together back over here and that's where it was leaking so it's getting fuel everywhere this looks at the engine itself it's a Jabiru 3300 120 horsepower engine but what I draw your attention to is this tube right here see where the light hits it right there it's green I don't want any fuel leaking out here, so that's uh, being replaced. Here's another look at the engine from the other side. I apologize for the focus, but I was more interested in the aircraft than photography at the time. But see that green tube right there? That's fuel. And boy, I don't want that old, um, mistreated, overheated, cracked stuff in there, that's for sure. Now they had to make some holes in the wing to get to the tank and so this is some special stuff. Aircraft Spruce and Specialty Company is sort of the DX engineering for aircraft parts. And so um, this is the fabric cement that they use to uh, patch up the holes that are going to be up there. Now I want to talk about something else. This is the bombshell. This is the one that puts shivers up and down my spine. Now again, this is an experimental amateur built aircraft. And in order to keep the weight down, uh, you don't have a lot of the coverings and stuff you see. You see this cable right here? Okay, that's a rudder cable. It's connected to the rudders. There's another one on the other side over here. Okay, and you've got to be kind of careful that you don't kick these things when you're uh, inside. Okay, now if you look just behind the seat, there is this pulley for the rudder cable. This is the rudder cable coming from up front, coming underneath and going back to the rudder. Now when they went to put in the black tube, that's the fuel line right there, they found it kind of hung on something there. It hung up on something. And in order, to, they kind of looked in there to figure out what it was, and lo and behold, the cable has started to come apart. Two of the strands were broken. You can just see the other ends of them right there. This is the new pitot tube that's the new fuel line. This is frame, the steel frame here. Let's look a little bit closer. This is not really solidly in focus, but you can see here really clearly the rudder cable coming apart. Well, I think you can imagine that that rudder cable is going to be replaced very quickly and the other cables inspected very carefully because if this came apart in flight, we would have no rudder. The airplane is needs ailerons um, elevators and the rudder in order to for the three directions of flying up you know uh, pitch rolling yaw axes um, so this is the one that sent shivers up and down my spine this is not just an airworthiness issue, but a crash waiting to happen. So, needless to say, that's all being fixed. I'm very glad they tried to run the tube under there. One of the problems with inspecting the rudder line is that you use the pedals 
in the aircraft to steer the front wheel, okay, as well as the rudder. Now, when you take off, the front wheel disengages and just hangs there, so you're just turning the rudder. All right, but when it's on the ground, it's hard to push these pedals because you're trying to push the front uh, front wheel around, and that's hard to do. So it's very hard to inspect it, and this brake was right underneath where it couldn't be seen. Uh, the other cables you can move back and forth very easily. This one you can't. So what we'll do is, um, you know, we'll just pull the tail of the aircraft down so the air so that the um, front wheel is in the air and then um, check this cable we're going to put in a whole new cable for that and we'll check the other cables to see if anything like that has happened before so there it is my poor aircraft uh, in the hospital and I went visiting it yesterday I should have brought it some roses or something um, as it's being repaired by some very competent mechanics up there. So that is my aircraft story about what happens when you buy something used. Now the thing about aircraft is that um, for somebody buying a first aircraft you almost have to buy used. Um, and the um, stuff they you, they talk about a pre buy inspection and things like that i think that a number of these things would not be caught in a pre buy inspection cuz i looked at it really closely and it sure looked good to me uh we found out there was something interesting one of the cylinders on the other side has a leak at the base aircraft engines are so out of date mechanically uh, there isn't a block in which are uh, drilled uh, cylinders. Rather, the cylinders is like old-time motorcycles. You know, the cylinder itself comes off and can be honed out and put back on. Anyway, there's a leak at the base of that, and just a little leak. Uh, but there wasn't one I looked at it. I asked to look at the engine, and it was gleaming. And we decided that it was toothbrushed. Uh, to make it look gleaming because there definitely was a leak there, still is. Uh, it's not enough to worry about, but uh, we do have the part on order to do that. And when they get the part, they'll, they'll put that in. Um, so, you know, you almost have to buy used and you don't know what problems you're buying. Now, this is why I give the advice to ham radio operators when you are new to the hobby, don't buy someone else's problems. Now, this aircraft, like I said, it had been in a in a in an accident that resulted in some damage to the front wheel and stuff like that. It had all been fixed, but in the meantime, the thing had spent years in a hangar till. Um, the owner decided it was time to pull that aircraft out, refurbish it, get everything right, and sell it. And I'm the buyer. And I found out about the accident, not because he told me, but because I did due diligence. I went on the National Transportation and Safety Board and uh, looked up the accident report and downloaded the entire portfolio, including the evaluator's comments, and they were juicy. Um, the fellow who was flying the aircraft when it crashed uh, had a control link failure, and um, he is actually the one who gave me the demo ride. And the idea was that if he was willing to fly this aircraft again, it's okay. And I, I believe that. I mean, it did fly, but here we're finding problems with the tubing and so on and so forth. And you can find problems with 10 or 20 year old radios that uh, may have been um, 
key down too long with no load or uh, a lot of the old tube radios like that FT-101B up there. Uh, the tubes in those things are very easy to destroy. You don't know that you've destroyed them. They look the same, but they don't tune up right. As it turns out, this one has very good tubes in it. I didn't know that when I bought it, but it turns out to have very good tubes in it. Um, a lot of the older radios may not. They may have a transistor that's been overstressed or something like that. So if you're going to buy used equipment, I would say fly it for a while. In other words, get it from somebody you know and borrow it first. Put it on the air, test it out, use it for a month, and then buy it. See if you like it. Now, I've had this thing since July, and it is now February, and we're discovering serious problems with the aircraft. I'm very confident we will find them, and we will fix them, and this will turn out to be a great aircraft, okay? And that may be the case for your used equipment as well. But, um, you know, I think I, I know a lot about the history of the craft. I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident in it. Um, so I think it'll work. Anyway, I wanted to tell you that story because it just was a good illustration to me of why you, you know, in, in an aircraft you're trusting your life to that machine and the life of your passenger. And doggone it, it better be airworthy. And we found some things that we thought it was airworthy, but it turned out not to be air, airworthy. Now, I want to note that I did have an annual done on this in November. And they discovered a few things that need to be tweaked. Um, the most important one, interestingly, is the compass card. There's no compass calibration card. It's not airworthy in the eyes of the FAA without that compass cal calibration card. So we're going to make one. We've been trying to make one for a while, and we will do that before we go up and fly again. So I hope you enjoyed that little aircraft story. It's a little bit of a diversion from the kinds of things that I usually do. Uh, I am going to start uh, a YouTube channel on aviation about the time I can solo. I was very close to soloing last um, October when I had the intestinal bleed, so now we got to get me back to where we were then, and I'm hoping that um, I'm within 10 or 20 flying hours of soloing, and uh, then then I'll start the channel, and the channel's going to be kind of not gee, look at the pretty scenery, but uh, although I'll, I'll certainly have that, but sort of, um, this is what I'm learning today from doing this. This is what I'm learning. And yes, I will try ham radio from the aircraft. Definitely will. Okay? So, if you would like to support this channel financially, please go to decastlercom slash support. There's the tip jar, there's Patreon, there's... Uh, some things that if you buy on Amazon, I get a little bit of a kickback. There's all kinds of things that you can do there. And if one of those strikes your fancy, fine. If not, fine too. I just appreciate your support by subscribing, by clicking like, by telling other people about the channel, and uh, talking about this ham up in Colorado who's nuts because he's learning to fly at almost age 70. So, there you go. And until we next meet, 73.